10 Principles for Perpetual Peace for the 21st Century. Next year will mark the 230th anniversary of Immanuel Kant's celebrated essay on perpetual peace from 1795. The great German philosopher put forward a set of guiding principles to achieve perpetual peace among the nations of his day. As we grapple with the world at war, and indeed at dire risk of nuclear Armageddon, we should build on Kant's approach for our own time. An updated set of principles should be considered at the UN Summit of the Future in September. Kant was fully aware that his proposals would face the skepticism of, quote, practical politicians. As he said, the practical politician assumes the attitude of looking down with great self-satisfaction on the political theorist as a pedant whose empty ideas in no way threaten the security of the state, inasmuch as the state must proceed on empirical principles. So the theorist is allowed to play his game without interference from the worldly wise statesman. Nonetheless, as historian Mark Mazower noted in his magisterial account of global governance, Kant's text would intermittently influence generations of thinkers about world government down to our own day, end quote, helping to lay the groundwork for the United Nations and international law on human rights, the conduct of war, and arms control. Kant's core principles centered on three ideas. First, Kant rejected standing armies. Standing armies, quote, incessantly menace other states by their readiness to appear at all times prepared for war, unquote. In this, Kant anticipated by a century and a half the famous warning by President Dwight D. Eisenhower of the dangers of a military industrial complex. Second, Kant called for non-interference in the internal affairs of other nations. In this, Kant inveighed against the kind of covert operations that the United States has relentlessly used to topple foreign governments. Third, Kant called for a, quote, federation of free states, unquote, which in our time became the United Nations, a federation of 193 states pledged to operate under the UN Charter. Kant put great hopes on republicanism as opposed to one-person rule as a check on war-making. Kant reasoned that a single ruler would readily succumb to the temptation of war. As he put it, and I quote, a declaration of war is the easiest thing in the world to decide upon because war does not require of the ruler, who is the proprietor and not a member of the state, the least sacrifice of the pleasures of his table, the chase, his country houses, his court functions, and the like. He may therefore resolve on war as a pleasure party for the most trivial reasons, and with perfect indifference leave the justification which decency requires to the diplomatic corps who are ever ready to provide it, unquote. By contrast, according to Kant, and I quote, if the consent of the citizens is required in order to decide that war should be declared, and in this Republican constitution, it cannot but be the case, nothing is more natural than that they would be very cautious in commencing such a poor game, decreeing for themselves all the calamities of, all the calamities of war. Unquote. Kant went too far uh, in his optimism about the ability of public opinion to constrain war making. Both the Athenian and Roman republics were notoriously belligerent. Britain was the 19th century's leading democracy, but perhaps its most belligerent power. And for decades, the United States has engaged in nonstop wars of choice and violent overthrows of foreign governments. There are at least three reasons why Kant was over-optimistic about republicanism. First, even in democracies, the choice to launch wars almost always lies with a small elite group who are in fact largely insulated from public opinion. Second, and equally important, Public opinion is relatively easy to manipulate through propaganda to stir the public backing for war. Third, 
The public can be insulated in the short term from the high costs of war by financing war through debt rather than taxation, as has been the case in the United States, and by relying on contractors, paid recruits, and foreign fighters rather than on conscripts. Kant's core ideas on perpetual peace nonetheless help move the world towards international law, human rights, and the decent conduct uh, in war, such as the Geneva Conventions uh, during the 20th century. Yet despite the innovations in global institutions, the world remains dreadfully far from peace. According to the doomsday clock of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, we are 90 seconds to midnight, closer to nuclear war than at any time since the clock's introduction in 1947. The global apparatus of the United Nations and international law has arguably prevented a third world war to date. UN Secretary General Utant, for example, played a vital role in peacefully resolving the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Yet the UN-based structures are fragile and in need of urgent upgrade. For this reason, I urge that we formulate and adopt a new set of principles based on four key geopolitical realities of our time. First, we are living with the nuclear sword of Damocles over our heads. President John F. Kennedy put it eloquently 60 years ago in his famous peace speech when he declared, and I quote, I speak of peace because of the new face of war. Total war makes no sense in an age where great powers can maintain large and relatively invulnerable nuclear forces and refuse to surrender without resort to those forces. It makes no sense in an age where a single nuclear weapon contains almost 10 times the explosive force delivered by all the Allied air forces in the Second World War." End quote. Second, we have arrived at true multipolarity in the world. For the first time since the 19th century, Asia has overtaken the West in economic output. We are long past the Cold War era in which the US and Soviet Union dominated, or the quote, unipolar moment claimed by the United States after the demise of the Soviet Union in 1991. The US is now one of several superpowers, including Russia, China, and India with several regional powers as well, including Iran, Pakistan, and North Korea. The U.S. and its allies cannot unilaterally exact their will in Ukraine, the Middle East, or the Indo-Pacific region. The U.S. must learn to cooperate with the other powers. Third, we now have an extensive and historically unprecedented set of international institutions for formulating and adopting global goals such as regarding climate change and sustainable development and nuclear disarmament, for adjudicating international law and expressing the will of the global community, such as in the UN General Assembly and the UN Security Council. Yes, these international institutions are still weak when the great powers choose to ignore them, yet they offer invaluable tools for building a true federation of nations in Kant's sense. Fourth, Humanity's fate is more tightly interconnected than ever. Global public goods, such as sustainable development, nuclear disarmament, protection of the Earth's biodiversity, prevention of war, pandemic prevention and control, are far more central to our shared fate than at any previous time in human history. Again, we can turn to JFK's wisdom, which rings as true today as 60 years ago. And I quote, so let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures and we are all mortal. What principles should we adopt in our time that could contribute to perpetual peace? 
I propose 10 principles for perpetual peace in the 21st century and invite others to revise, edit, or make their own list. The first five of my principles are the principles of peaceful coexistence proposed by China 70 years ago and subsequently adopted by the non-aligned nations. These are, one, mutual respect of all nations for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of other nations. Two, mutual non-aggression of all nations towards other nations. Three, mutual non-interference by all nations in the internal affairs of other nations such as through wars of choice or regime change operations or unilateral sanctions. Four, equality and mutual benefits in the interactions among nations. Five, peaceful coexistence of all nations. To implement these five core principles, I recommend five specific principles of action. Six, the closure of overseas military bases of which the US and UK have by far the largest number. Seven, the end of covert regime change operations and unilateral coercive economic measures, which violate as grave violations the principles of non-interference in the internal affairs of other nations. I note that political scientist Lindsay O'Rourke has carefully documented 64 U.S. covert regime change operations during 1947 to 1969, and also the pervasive destabilization that was caused by such operations. Eight, adherence by all nuclear powers, the United States, Russia, China, UK, France, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea, to Article 6 of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and I quote, all parties must pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to the cessation of the nuclear arms race and to nuclear disarmament, and on a treaty on general and complete disarmament under strict and effective international control, end quote. Nine, the commitment by all countries, quote, not to strengthen their security at the expense of the security of other countries, end quote, as per the Charter of the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. States will not enter into military alliances that threaten their neighbors and commit to resolve disputes through peaceful negotiation and security arrangements backed by the UN Security Council. And 10, the commitment by all nations to cooperate in protecting the global commons and providing global public goods, including fulfillment of the Paris Climate Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the reform of UN institutions. Today's great power confrontations, notably the U.S. conflicts with Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, are largely due to America's continued pursuit of unipolarity via regime change operations, wars of choice, unilateral coercive measures, and the global network of U.S. military bases and alliances. The 10 principles that I have recommended would help to move the world to peaceful multilateralism governed by the U.N. Charter and the international rule of law. Thank you very much. 